How many times have you been hired by a Hollywood studio or producer where they did not require you to outline for writing a script? Um, that's sort of tricky because I would never not outline. So therefore, whether they required or not, I was going to do it. The interesting thing is whether or not they understood how much work an outline is. <laughs> um, because the truth is, very often, in order to figure out the solutions to a story, to make the choices of a story, because that's really what figuring out the solutions is, is saying, it's going to be a story about this, it's going to be a story where this is the central action. That's the outlining process. And that's very, very difficult. That can take as harder work than writing the script. And so everyone is always asking you to essentially do that work before they decide whether they're going to hire you. Um, although things have changed a, a little bit, but truthfully, most people assume that an outline is very short <laughs> and they did them in school, so it's not a big deal. But an outline is really the main work of screenwriting. And it can take twice as long as writing the script itself. If you've got a good outline, you can write a script and it will go pretty quickly. Figuring out all the possible shapes and choices of an outline, that's brutally hard. Um, so the answer is, I would never take on a job that I hadn't at least roughly outlined because I wouldn't know that I could solve it. Um, do people ask you to do outlines for free? Yes. Should you do it for free? No. Um, eh. It depends on where you are in your career and what it's worth to you. If you want the experience of doing the outline and you want to gain their trust, but don't do something you're going to regret for free. <laughs> I think that would be my advice on that. Um, the other thing is um, features and shows are very different. In shows, the outline, breaking the story, is a required step for the company. Um, it's also usually not done alone. You don't usually send one person off to do it, although sometimes you do. Uh, depends on the showrunner. But um, outlining a show is part of the, literally part of the job. Like you go into the room, you start by breaking the story. So um, nobody would ask you to do that without being paid because you're already on the job. Do you have a proven style of outlining that has worked for you the most? It's proven to me <laughs> um, in the sense that, yeah, I think it's great. I've done a, if you check out my videos, there's one called Why Outline and one called How to Outline. The How to has the outline system. Um, but basically what it really comes down to is the important thing is to think in scenes and write a, a, a written version where you are writing down the scenes in a list. That's what an outline is. An outline is a list of scenes. Some people can do it on index cards. Um, they even have index card software where you can put a lot on it. Um, I believe that the important thing is to understand that you are breaking a story into scenes and that when you have your full list of scenes and you know what everything is going to happen in every scene and there's nothing missing, then you're ready to write. So that's the importance of an outline. The actual form of it it's whatever works for you. I believe that the most important thing, the thing to put in that first line, the, the, the headline of each outline step is not where it takes place or even what happens. It's what is the essential action, the point of the scene. So the point of this, like we were talking before about a scene where Maya gets fired. The point of that scene is that Maya gets unfairly fired. Um, you try to, make things active. Always try to put things in active form. So Maya gets fired is actually passive. She's getting fired. The scene actually is Tommy fires Maya unfairly. Now for me, that's a scene line because I know exactly what the action is. And I try to always break it down to that. Sometimes, you know, I'm the only one looking at it. Oh, that's the other thing. Outlines should be for you. Outlines are not to be read by other people. It's a workspace. It's a workplace. Um, if you have to do an outline for another person, that's a performance. You should copy your outline and then write a version for other people to read. But, but for you to work in an outline, the important thing is that you're doing whatever will trigger you to understand the point of the scene. Sometimes I know a scene so well that I'll just write, Joe drives to Dallas. Now, I know that during the course of that, he has to have a breakdown, but it doesn't matter. I know what that means. But really, the scene is Joe has a breakdown while driving to, <laughs> to Dallas. 
The important thing is the central action of the scene. And while there may be many steps in any scene, um, there's usually one thing more than anything else that that scene is about, and that's the point of the outline. Then for me, underneath it, I'll put everything I can think of. I'll write dialogue in my outline. I'll do whatever I can, because I can always just cut and paste it out later. But that space under the headline is where you can ask yourself questions. Um, you can, and I write them in a different color. I write, why is Joe having a breakdown? How do we know that Joe is having a breakdown? And then I'll answer it. Um, and I'll describe, maybe I'll say like he crumples up his hamburger and smashes it into the rear view mirror, whatever it is, I'm trying to get everything I can into the outline so that I will know what it is when I write the scene. Those outline descriptions can be very long. They can be arguments with myself. Um, the most important thing to do though is break everything into a scene. There's nothing that is going to go into your script that isn't in a scene. So the whole point of an outline is to get you to remember, if I don't have a scene where that happens, if I don't have a scene where that subject is raised or that feeling occurs, it's not gonna be in the story. How common is it for you to write backwards? I always believe everyone should write backwards, but by that I do not mean you actually start in the last scene and write, <laughs> write backwards. I mean, know the ending. That's really what write backwards means. Uh, write backwards is a crucial thing because until you know the ending, you don't actually know what your story is about. For instance, um, if, if you're telling a story in which someone is trying to save their sister from lions, <laughs> then whether or not they actually do save their sister and how they do it, do they do it by overcoming their fear of lions or do they do it by learning lion language and telling the lions to stop, that's going to be what the story's about. And until you know that last thing, the thing that resolves the tension, you don't really know how to write anything else. So work backwards really means know your ending. Once you know the ending, everything else makes sense in a different way because you know that it's an obstacle towards that or a step towards that. When you were asked to take out that core part of the one script, um, did you go back to your outline and you saw it there, I don't know if it was like the midpoint or where it was, and then try to rearrange, like how, how did, when, when you went to that, what was your reaction to seeing that? Actually, I, I totally failed on the first time I had to do this, so I'll tell you about the second time when I succeeded at it. But the important thing is if you're taking out the core of a story, if you're taking out the essential center of the story, it's not gonna be in one place. The horrible thing, the reason that you can't do it is because it's in every scene, and that every single action the person's taking is about a thing, and if they say, let's not do that thing, then you're really in trouble because you have to rewrite everything. Um, and worse than rewrite everything, you don't have any reason to do the other thing. Uh, so you don't just tear it out, you have to replace it. Um, I was working on a thriller. It was about a schizophrenic woman uh, living in New York. She had just been released from a mental hospital and she's living in a crappy poor apartment in Hell's Kitchen and the woman next door to her is having an affair with a police officer, a street cop. And the, they have an argument, the, the lovers have an argument, and during the argument, they, the woman grabs the cop's gun, it goes off while he's trying to get it back, and he kills her. The schizophrenic woman hears all this through the wall and tries to leave. Um, and when she does, the cop sees her. And the rest of the thriller is, what's going to happen about that? I was in a very ornate 1970s character-based kind of frame of mind. So not only did I add that, but I added two more characters. One was an evil sergeant who was trying to force the cop, who was actually not a bad guy, to kill the witness. So the villain is actually the murderer's boss. The woman who has the witness has nowhere to go. No, no one's going to listen to her. She's schizophrenic. She says she heard something to the wall. What, you know. Um, so the one person that she had to turn to in my first draft of the story was a guy who was an orderly in the hospital where she was. And he was very kind to her. And she finds him and she tells him what happened and she asks for his help. 
that was a very ornate, complex set of relationships. And um, Jodie Foster's company um, loved it, but it was difficult. And they, God bless them, they gave me a lot of money and a lot of time and they worked with me and we worked on it trying to figure out how to make it a little more acceptable to the studio system. Um, and uh, the executive there was Meg Lefauve, who is now a phenomenal teacher and writer. Um, and we worked on it and she never asked the thing that I knew we needed. <laughs> but she never said, could we cut one of these four characters? <laughs> You've got a thriller with four main characters. And I eventually said, I think there's a way to get rid of the guy that the mentally ill one person goes to. Now that was taking out the core of the story because by the end of the story, they have teamed up to defeat the evil sergeant. And so I was removing the center of the story. Um, and I had been asked before in other jobs to remove the center of the story and it just ruined my life. So in this case, I thought, you know, I asked the essential question, what is this story about? And the story was about this woman who knew that she had heard a real thing, but because of her disability, people were not taking her seriously. And the people who were taking her seriously were trying to kill her. Right. Mm -hmm. She's the center of the story. And I had divided her action among two people. I thought that was cool. As a writing exercise, it is cool. As a movie for Jodie Foster, it's not cool. It was a dumb choice. <laughs> but on the other hand, when I wrote it, Jodie Foster wasn't going to do it. So um, once I moved into that position, I thought, you know what? This woman's character needs to hold the whole story on herself. And the relationship really is about her and the poor policeman in between her and the villain. So from a four-way story, I made it a three-way story. Um, it was better. It was a better version. Now, I had worked really hard on the four-way version, and I loved it. And I was very proud of myself for recognizing that there are, even with something that is, gr like, I think it's great, the original version, but it's not the only way to do it. And that was a real breakthrough for me to recognize that something that I loved and felt right also had another version that I loved and eventually felt was even more right. The triangle version was much more powerful and the characters became much more interesting. So how do you do it? You look at what is the real center of the story. The center of the story was this woman that because of her disability had very limited ability to defend herself or get help and how she found the resources of communicating with people to solve that problem. Did the film ever get made with another? Alas, no, oh. it didn't. And they tried, they tried so hard. They were yeah. wonderful. Um, they, they did, but it was just a really hard project at a really hard time. And there's a lot of times when something, you don't get all the pieces together. And if you follow the trades, you'll often see this happening where a passion project for someone, but it requires to get the right alignment of stars and financing and all these other things have to come together and everyone has to believe in it for all their own reasons. It's a, a frankly a, a astonishing that anything gets made at all. Mm, I would watch that movie. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's wow, that's, that's powerful. Yeah. Mm. But, um, but the answer is how do you remove the center of your story? And the answer is you look for where it is in the story and you'll usually find it's, it's not what you, the thing you're clinging to, because the thing you're clinging to is clearly making people uncomfortable. And if enough people are telling you something is not working for them, you have to come to a choosing point. You have to say, I want it to work for me and I don't care about anybody else. But if a, if a lot of people are saying, I really love this, but it's not working in this way, you have to think about, is there something about that that you can rethink? The other thing is sometimes you have to remove the heart of your story and then you better just replace it. Find a new heart, <laughs> find a new core to the story that works well and the story will keep living.
Wow, that was like so metaphorically well turned. <laughs> yeah, with with this story, was was the schizophrenic woman? Was it her journey out of um, the hospital into quote normalized life, or was it also getting people to regard her as? That was actually one of the big problems. Was it was very important to me to fairly portray what often is not shown in movies. Most movies are like, well, if they could just get sympathy, they'd be cured. Um, and the reality of, of her illness was that she was not going to get all over it with an insight. She had a, a serious mental illness, and the question was, how can she communicate and gain others' trust and learn to trust them in order to get help? Mm. Um, and so one of the hardest things was, essentially a lot of people wanted it to become a story about someone who's a neglected action hero. And, and that's not what, what the company wanted. You know, they really respected the point of the script and certainly not what I intended. I wanted to try and talk about what it's like to have a mental illness and need to work with it. 